Hello and welcome to Red Tree Church's online service. We just wanted to say thank you so much for listening in today. And no matter where you are tuning in from, we love to stay connected with our online community, whether that's through our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, our Church Center app, or of course our podcast. And whether this is your first time listening or your hundredth time listening, we hope that you are encouraged and inspired by today's message. So let's take a listen. Well, good morning, Red Tree. You guys still doing all right this morning? Good, 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 good. Hey, take your Bibles. We are going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 6, where we're going to spend the majority of our time. We are going to jump back a little bit to some Old Testament, Ecclesiastes, and Deuteronomy. And so there'll be a couple pieces that we're going to pick up there to tie it all in together. And so uh, today we're speaking of a subject that is pretty sensitive to a lot of people. And so uh, we're just going to finish up the series uh, this week and next week. And so uh, this week we're talking about something that everyone is so passionate about. Um, we lose our minds when people talk about it. We lose our minds when we, when we have more of it. We lose our minds when we don't have enough of it. And it's just something that all of us want more of. How many of you would love to have more money? Anybody? Anybody just love to have more money? Yeah, if your hand's not up, then you, you're lying. And so, um, so what we have done here this morning is we've put a $100 bill underneath. Uh, there's in, in, on one chair in each row, there's a $100 bill underneath it. And so if you can find it real quick, it's yours. You can have it. No problem. And so um, that's, that's not true. That's not true at all. Some of like, oh, man, you little jerk. I had my kids looking for me. And so anyways, um, yeah. So uh, if, if we could all just have more money, it'd be like, yes, now, now I will be happier with, with what we have. Um, and that's absolutely not true. And the easiest way to prove that point is at one point in your life, you may have been in high school or college, and you made way less money then but you were enjoying life what you thought to be way better at that point, right? You weren't as stressed about it as much. You thought you were stressed, right? But now that you've kind of grown up more and you're like, oh no, bro, I know what stress is now. Uh, I was telling someone yesterday, I remember sitting at Two Rivers Church during a staff meeting up by St. Louis and sitting at this, at this huge desk and all of our staff's there and hearing Pastor Ron talk about it. And I was like, I bet I work just as hard as he does. Um, being, being a student pastor, and now I'm a, the lead pastor going, well, it wasn't even close, man, not even close. And so it, it changes as you grow, as you mature, as you see things adjust. And so today we're talking about more money. And, and how many of you know, mo money means what? Mo problems. Yeah, and they get bigger too, don't they? Right? Your kids get bigger, your kids get older, their gifts get bigger, the problems get bigger. And so today we're talking about money, and next week we're going to talk about politics and sex. And so it is going to be fantastic next week, right? Because I believe we've, we've twisted a lot of different things when it comes to all three of these subjects. And so the last two just seem like it'd be great to package together, because when you mix them, it's never good. Anyway, um, we, we're, we're, we're talking about money today, and all of us want more money, but money is, is, sometimes people say this, and this is the twist, money is the root of all evil. And that's actually not true. That's actually not, that's not biblically true either. You're like, wait, wait, wait. I, I, I thought like if the, the poorer you are, the more faith you have in Christ. And that's actually not true. But then there's also a whole group where the pendulum swings this way. And they're like, no, no, no. It's, it's prosperity gospel. The richer you are, the more you have, the more that God's favor is upon you. And that's actually not true either. And so you have a group this way, you have a group this way, and hopefully we can just ride right in the middle where Jesus is, right? Isn't that where we want to be on this thing? Amen. Good. I got one solid amen so far. Wait till next week. It's going to be awesome. Um, so when, again, I told you, when, when we talk about money, it gets weird because people say the church just wants my money, and, and that's, that's not true. We want way more than that from you. Uh, your money is just a benefit. And so um, we, we love to see God draw you closer to him. Um, but, but a lot of times, unfortunately, if we can just be honest, it stops when it comes to our money. Because we feel like we are in control of at least our own money. And we're not giving it to that. Because you've seen a story on TV where there was a, a pastor that went crazy or a TV evangelist that went crazy. And they're wearing clothes and shoes and the reason you're mad about it is not because they're wearing it, it's because you want it. And so now we have a whole pride thing and a whole jealousy thing to deal with too. And you're like, I don't want to be convicted about that. Let's just make it about them, right? Too much, too soon? Okay, anyways. 
Um, right, and so, so we, we wrestle with this concept of money, and for some of you, are like, man, my family's never had money, and so we wouldn't know what to do with it even if we did. And like, you know, like you heard that song, we were so poor that we couldn't tell when Wall Street fell, right? You remember that? Some of you are like, what, what is Wall Street? We thought you'd find that like in, in Hollywood somewhere, all right? And so like for you, money is a topic that's kind of difficult to hear about, but here's the deal is I want you to become comfortable talking about money. Because th th this is what I've learned as a pastor. I've done this for a little over 10 years now as a lead pastor. When I speak about subjects that people get mad about, it reveals they don't do it well, right? It, it, it just, it doesn't matter what it is. I can speak of adultery. I can speak of alcoholism. I can talk about any type of addiction. And I can talk about money. And any of these subjects, people are like, man, you just need to, you speak about this all the time. Like, three, four times a year. And my leadership team's like, hey, man, you need to talk about this more. Hey, man, you need to preach about this more. Hey, man, you need to do this more. I'm like, well, people freak out like once a year when I preach about it. And so it's like, oh, I know why. I know why. So if you get up and walk out, we'll know where your struggle is anyway. Uh, don't come back next week. <sighs> so it's, it, it's difficult because the world has twisted it because we've made it what we want it to be. And really, it's not complicated. It's not complex. If you look at 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, verse 10, uh, we, we've, we've used this verse a lot. We talk about this every time we do the Give It Away campaign. And, and at that Sunday, I tell you, we do want all of your money. And the reason is because we want to be known for something in our community more than just a space of people to gather, but a group of people who believe in humanity and love all people and we give to these not-for-profit organizations so that they can continue to reach people that we will not reach, right? That's what we want to be. You guys want to be a part of that? Okay, good. And so 1 Timothy chapter 6, no more questions today. It's not going to go well. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 10 says this, and I just want to read the first part of it. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for who you are. God, as we dive into your word, Lord, I pray that you would help me to be able to speak uh, your truth. But God, help me to preach your truth in love so that we may know that we're exactly where you wanted us to be. God, help us to, to maybe even wrestle with this concept, this idea. Is this an Old Testament teaching that we're trying to drag into the New Testament? Or is this something that you really desire from all of us today? God, help us to understand who you are more in our lives. What a privilege it is to call you Father and to be able to follow you daily. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So if, if you are here this morning and you're a Christ follower, there are certain things that you can no longer dodge. There are certain things that you hear Jesus say, you read in the New Testament, and it is not an option. It is like, okay, I don't understand it. I'm not sure how to handle this. But because it's what Jesus said or it's the way that he lived, that's what I'm going to do. I wrestle with things like that myself still to this day. We talked about last week authority. And there's a struggle at times in my life with authority because it's like, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Why would I do that? Well, because Jesus tells us that we are to submit to authority, right? And so we are to be underneath that authority, but remain underneath Jesus' authority. And I know maybe for some there's a little bit of a, a fog in that, so I apologize. But if there's any questions about any sermon you ever hear me preach, reach out to me. I would love to hang out and sip coffee and, uh, and just talk about, about faith, okay? So please don't ever feel like, you, you, well, that was crazy. Chad's falling off his rocker. Um, that may be true, but we can still get together and talk about it, okay? But today, as we're, we're, we're looking at this idea of money, um, if you jump into Ecclesiastes 5, verse 10, it'll be up on the screen for you. It says this, watch this. Whoever loves money never has enough. Has anyone ever noticed that? Whoever loves money never has enough. Anybody? Okay, again, great participation from a few of you. And, and, and this is why. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. It doesn't matter if you make 20000 you're going to want 40000 It doesn't matter if you make 40000 you're going to want to make 80000 It doesn't matter if you make 80000 you're going to want to hit 100000 right? There's always that next up. There's always that next level because you have your eyes set on something, and these somethings are not bad until they begin to consume you. Let me explain what consuming is. When you cannot get away from marketplace because you're trying to find one, okay? It is, it's when you cannot go through your clothes and you just happen to touch a whole room full of clothes and look back at your husband 
or your wife and say, I just, I just have nothing to wear. I just, I don't know. It is consuming you. It's like when you look at this like wall full of shoes and you're like, no, those are yesterday. Those are, those are the day. Um, I just need, if I just had those new Yeezys or if I just had that new whatever it may be and it begins to consume you. This is what's happening in my life with a bass boat right now. Okay. <laughs> I'm not speaking hypothetically. I'm telling y'all, I am on, I can tell you where every bass boat is right now in the state of Missouri and how much it is, okay? And if those jokers come down $3,000, I got one, okay? All right, so it, it, it's, when, it's when we start to look to other things and then we, and here's what we do, man, if I had a boat, man, I could, I could begin to disciple some of y'all, right? Get you on the wall, ain't that right, guys? Yeah. Thank you, babe, we gotta make it happen, we gotta make it happen. And so, like, but, but see, th th this is what we do is we, we quickly begin to look for what's called confirmation bias, meaning I need you to confirm what's within me is true. So therefore we can all be right together, even when it may not be true. Right. And, and this, this is the process and what we begin to do. And we do this with money because we, we decide how we want to spend it, when we want to spend it. And what we're seeing in Ecclesiastes 5 is that there's never, ever going to be enough. So go, go back to one, uh, first Timothy chapter six. 6 and 7 says this, but godliness, starting in verse 6, but godliness, watch this, with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. You want to figure out how to be content in life? Pursue godliness in all things that you do. Maybe God will bless you with the basketball. Maybe you'll get an opportunity to buy that thing you're wanting. Maybe you can have those things. And there's nothing wrong. Hear me, hear me on this. Please hear me on this. There is nothing wrong with having nice things. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the things that you have. God has blessed some of you with some tremendous things. But what are you doing with them, right? What are you doing for I, People tell me all the time, man, Pastor, I really, I really wish you'd pray that my kid would get into this. I really wish you'd pray that I would get this new job. And my question all the time is, will this impact you coming on Sundays or being able to meet with your small group? Well, yeah, I'm going to juggle things out. I was like, oh, I'm going to pray, but it ain't going to be the way you want me to pray, right? And it's like when, when we get these things, when we choose to begin to idolize certain things, it moves priority of what should be there. And what we're told in 1 Timothy is Paul speaking to Timothy. He's saying, hey, man, be careful with this because here's what you need to know. When you are pursuing godliness, there will be great contentment within that. You've tried all these other things and you have found that there's not a lot of great contentment, but there's great gain. And in verse seven, he continues on. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. I, I, I love this. I heard it a long time ago and maybe you heard it, but you, you, have you ever noticed you never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul? Have you ever noticed that before? Like you never, like, hey man, we're, we're okay. Well, we're going to a funeral and we got all the stuff we're going to take with. No, you, you, you don't notice it. You don't see that. Because you did not bring anything with you into this world, and you cannot take anything with you when you exit this world. Here's a, here's a crazy statistic. One out of one people are going to die. Did you know that? That's a pretty high statistic, isn't it? Some of you are like, man, where's he getting these numbers? He needs to check it right now. I don't know. Oh, and I also heard that 75% of the statistics are made up on the spot. But anyway... Um, one out of one people are going to die. Like that's one that, 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 that you, you can bet on, right? You can bet on that. You're not going to take anything with you. And did you know this? You will run out of time before you run out of money. You, you absolutely will. Some of you are like, no, bro, I've already run out. No, you don't. How did you get here this morning? You either, either walk. So you got some shoes on your feet. You got clothes on your body. You, you, you own something. You have something. Eventually time will run out before all of your material possession will. And what Paul is trying to convey to First Tim or to Timothy is this. There are some of us who have been given great privilege and great honor, and we've been blessed, but we need to be careful what we do with this. So let, let, let's continue on in verse 8. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. It, it, it's interesting that it, you can just travel, maybe even a 10-hour flight, a 12-hour flight, will land you in a completely different spot in this world. And you will see what it begins to look like to have nothing. But you'll begin to see what Paul just spoke of. When you pursue godliness, there is great contentment. There is great gain in that. 
you, you, you don't have to raise your hands, but just ask, answer this in, in your own mind of, have you ever been on a mission trip where you go to another space and you feel like you're the one going to show up and be the hero for them and, and you're there and all of a sudden you, you see how maybe you go to visit in the village and the lady of the home has swept the dirt floors for you because she doesn't want to be embarrassed, because she wants to honor you, she wants to host you well. And they try to clean up the dirt floors the best way they can because you are coming to visit them. And you walk around and you just look and you see where there's no plumbing established in most of these places. The water takes hours to go to and then hours to bring back. And it is such nasty water full of so many nasty viruses and they have to drink it because there's not an option. And then you walk back into your home and you throw up your lazy boy and you push a button and a TV comes on and you think all of a sudden, maybe, maybe I don't have it as bad as I thought I once did. You see, this is what happens when you and I begin to look for fulfillment in other ways outside of Jesus. When we, when we shift our focus, when we shift what matters most, we lose this contentment that at one time we used to have. I love what Craig Rochelle, he says this, discontentment makes rich people poor and contentment makes poor people rich. Isn't that awesome? I'll say it again. Discontentment makes rich people poor and contentment makes poor people rich rich. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, uh, we'll continue on verses 9 through 10. Watch this because some of you have even asked me this question about, hey man, should I gamble? Should I not gamble? What should I do? And Chad, would you pray that I do win the lottery? And I've already shared with you my whole lottery theory is it's actually a reverse tithe. If you do win the lottery, you got to give 90% of it to the church and you only get to keep 10%. So make sure y'all really want to win that, okay? That's the only way I'm praying for all y'all. Anyway, Paul said this, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Now, I, I know for some of you, because I know your stories, this is an all true statement and, and, and it impacted your life. At one time, your marriage was great. Your marriage was fine. But then you begin to make this investment. You begin to pursue this this next career move, and it was great, but all of a sudden there's more demands on that because now you've been elevated even more in that career. And now you and your spouse feel a little bit of tension in it, and you feel like you don't really understand who your kids are anymore. You don't really understand what's going on. At one time you would come home, and it was like, leave it to Beaver, like, and all the kids ran to you, and they're like, Daddy, you're my hero. And now you walk in, and it's like walking into a hornet's nest. And like, it, it, if, if you can go back and you begin to look and see what happened, it was when this discontentment began to build within you to where you begin to maybe pursue something else. And all of a sudden, this, what you thought was going to be great gain, actually became discontentment in your life because of pursuing what you thought may be best for career, and it actually become detrimental for your family. So let's continue on. It gets worse. Verse 10, it says this. For the love of money, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, listen, and then, let me just say this real quick, Red Tree. This is not us, okay? This is those people, all right? Good? We good? Okay, here we go. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. One of the struggles that I have as a pastor, and I'm trying to get better at this, is when we become good friends, like from the, from the pastor to the, to the congregation, and then all of a sudden, some just disappear. And like for me, that is one of the greatest struggles that I have. And I don't know if that's good, or I don't know if that's the thing that's going to put me in the grave like 40 years early. I, I don't know. I, I've got to figure this balance out. But that verse is the thing that I see so much 
where it begins to draw people the wrong direction. It, it, it's when this, this shift begins to where you finally got that thing you wanted. And now it's the thing that is contending the most with your time. It's the thing that, that you struggle with the most. Because now that you have bought it, now you feel obligated to at least use it, right? Or, or go with it, or, or maybe go there, or spend time. And, and all of these things start to happen. And, and, I, and I'll just say this. And again, I, I hope, because sometimes we, we buy the twist. For parents, it starts when we begin to let our kids lead our families. And again, I know that's like, man, you got to be careful with that. Listen, your coaches, your leaders, your, your whatever it may be, they will give you several opportunities to do anything but continue to go to church. And I understand your daughter is probably going to be the next best person we've ever heard of when it comes to underwater knitting, okay? And it is a big deal, and I understand that. But I just want to stand and kind of wave a white flag for you and say, hey, hey, be cautious, be careful. You are the leaders of the family. Please, by all means, protect that. Continue to lead them to follow Jesus, right? Amen. Man, we got to get this red tree. Listen, we do not want to lead our kids to where it is like, well, maybe I'll choose to follow. And I get the pushback. I already feel the pushback. Where it's like, are you telling me I got to be here every Sunday? No! But at least once or twice a month would be great. Listen, and, and, and I hate this word. I try not to ever use this word anymore. COVID has changed our lives. COVID has changed our lives to where we have become more comfortable to disengage. And I'm not just talking about from church. I'm talking about in all things now to where we don't really want to commit to anything. And it's led us to a spot to where, well, if something else better comes up, I'm going to go ahead and do that, right? It's kind of like this. My mom's like, hey, you guys want to come over? I'm like, what are you making? Like, now, my mom is a smoking cook. I mean, she can cook anything. But every now and then she'll try to throw in some stuff that's like green and things like that. I ain't having none of that. So like, it, it's, it, but, but listen, here, here's what we've done. We've done this in our faith. And I, and I make you laugh because I'm getting ready to like, Poof. would I really want to go to church or is there anything else I can do? You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to catch you on Tuesday. I'm going to catch you on Wednesday. I'm going to catch you on Thursday. <laughs> How many of you hated online church from our service of a terrible production, right? It's like, I'll be up here preaching like, and then God said, uh, 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 and then Moses, man, when he said, uh, uh, and all of a sudden, like, forget it, I'm out, Right? That was me re-watching the thing. I'm like, this is terrible. I don't want to do this. This is ridiculous. And then you're like, oh, no, man, I got so much from that. Did you really? Oh, we got something from it, all right. A whole big thing, a discontentment. And it has led us at one time where it's like a space in which you want to be like, man, do you just want people to come to church? I want you to be at church. And, and, and I say this, and I mean this as nice and as respectful and honest as I can. And, and I mean this, if this is not the place you can get plugged in, which I don't know why it wouldn't be, if this is not the space in which you want to raise your kids, and I have no earthly idea why you would not want to, then find a space, okay? It is not about numbers for me. I want what is best for you and for your family, right? And we will do whatever we can to make that happen. You want to get involved in a small group? Man, you let us know. You want to start a small group? You let us know. You want to serve in a ministry? You let us know. You want to help around here? You let us know. Now, be cautious of that because we need vacuum drain also, and we need some toilet scrub. Amen? And if you think you're too pretty or you're too good or you're too big and shot to do that, let me, find, let me help you find another place. But see, this, this concept is way bigger than just money, but today that's the focus on it because we've bought the twist. We, we have bought this twist of if I just had more, I'd be so much happier. 
if I had more, and then this is, this, is, this is what we pray to God. God, if you would give me more, I could do so much with what I got. And God's like, <clears throat> real quick there, Chad, what are you doing with what you got? We don't have enough. Hmm. You got this, you have this, you have this, you have this. You don't have to eat there all the time. You don't have to go there all the time. Switch it up. Now, that's just me. I know that's not, like I said, these are for those other people that Paul was talking about when he said, some people. You see, for me, I wave a white flag for you. But for what Paul says, God waves a red flag. And he's like, careful. Man, be so cautious. Be so, you are wandering. You are wandering the wrong direction. You are drifting down for such a long time. And it is a big deal. Deuteronomy 8, verse 18 says this, because this is the part that I want you to understand, because I know we beat down, and you got to give, and you need to do this, and you need to commit to tithe, and don't be an emotional giver, and, you know, if we have to, we can put up the screens. Like, In the arms of the angel, whatever you want us to do. I mean, we can do that. And you're like, oh my gosh, just take my money. Take my money. But see, we want it to be a spiritual thing for you. We want it to be an obedience thing for you. Have you ever noticed that sometimes you being spiritual has nothing to do with being obedient or feeling it? <laughs> but it's what God's called you to do. And you do it. And so th th this is what Deuteronomy says. I want to jump in this real quick and we've got to hurry up. You guys got to listen really fast to get this. He says, this, but remember the Lord your God. And which is huge, guys, just that part alone. But remember the Lord, capital L. Remember your God, capital G. The Lord your God. Watch what he says. For it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. My, my, my grandparents would always say, boy, you're getting a little bit too big for them britches. Anybody ever heard that before? Oh, you're getting a little bit too big for them britches. And, and this, this is what we do. Yeah, but man, I have served here. I've been going here. I got this degree. I've got this. I'm over this. I'm over this. And oh, okay, hey, Karen, calm down, Karen. <laughs> you're getting a little bit too big for your britches. Sorry, Karen, I apologize. You see, it, it's, it's the same with Paul. He's like, Paul, man, here's what you need to do. Tell him, Timothy. This is, this, this is what I want you to do, Timothy. This is what I want you to tell people, Timothy. Look at this. 1 Timothy 6, 17. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. Now watch what he says. Who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Paul, I know you're a young guy, and I know you're, you're going to go out there, man. You're going you're to give everything you have. Here's what I need you to do. Command those who are rich in this present world. Now, some of y'all are like, I ain't rich, man. Really? Some of us have houses where we have a house for our car, right? And that's how rich you are. And, and I've gone through this before. Like, if you have an opportunity to where you get mad about how slow your internet is, you're rich, Right? You get upset because of the cell phone reception, you're rich, right? You get in a vehicle and you drive from places, you are rich. If you make a phone call and somebody shows up at your doorstep with food, you are crazy rich. But you don't feel it, do you? It, it, it doesn't matter if you feel it. You see, be, being rich isn't, isn't about a feeling. In comparison to the people that Paul was talking about, you, you and I are easily, easily in the top 3% of the world. Hands down, top 3% of the world finances. So it, it's more about, listen, because I want to use this word. How are you stewarding the things that God's blessed you with? Because that's a biblical responsibility. To be good stewards of what we have. God's blessed you with, that's awesome. Get after it. Enjoy it. I mean, pursue it. 
Live it up. Love it. Let your family enjoy it. Invite other people over to hang out. Like, be a part of it. How are you stewarding the things in which God's blessed you with? And it's no different when it comes to finances. Where are you investing your finances so that it invests into people? I think we've had 57 people so far this year that have accepted Christ at Red Tree Church. And here's, yeah, amen, that's a big deal. That is phenomenal. I think at times we get too used to that, and we're just like, yeah, that's cute, whatever. Oh, no, man, praise God. Keep sending people. God, you keep sending people, and we'll keep inviting people. But here's what I need you to know. If you give to Red Tree Church, and you have been part of that, you are the reason in which we have the opportunity to continue to reach people. Because there's things that we have to do financially that we get the chance to do that, right? And then somebody's like, are you trying to tell me they wouldn't have gotten saved if I wouldn't? I don't, I don't know. I don't want to run down that trail too far. But what I do know is that we have been asked to be obedient in our finances and to be good stewards of our finances. And for some, there's been a discontentment for a while and you have shifted focus for a long time and God's like, hey, this is you. You see, it's been twisted. And I would even use the word maybe perverted a little bit. It, it, it's, it's, it's been perverted to where we've made it about us. We, we, we've made it to where we can say, well, okay, well, not, once I get comfortable, and that's not, that's not accurate at all. I want everybody to bow your head and close your eyes. I want to give you an opportunity to respond back. I'm not sure where you may be in faith. For some, maybe you're, you're, you're maybe what we would call on the outside, you're kind of looking in to see what, what, what church is or what faith may look like or really who is Jesus. Because at one point you, you thought you had an understanding of it, but man, things have happened and now you feel so far from what that may look like. And now you've been told, man, you, you, you're, you're so disqualified. You need to get to a better space. Once you get things figured out, then you can come back. And I just want you to know, that is not what Jesus taught. You see, we're, we're told in Romans that all of us, all of us have sinned and we have fallen so far short of the glory of God. I mean, none of us are perfect. None of us have any chance to stand on our own good and to say, what about now, God? Am I, am, I, am I good enough? You say, no, you're not. And then it even gets worse. It says, for the wages of those sin, the only payment that can be made for all of those sin is death, which means to be separated forever from a holy God. And then the good part comes in to where he says this. But if anyone will call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. You say, well, yeah, but tell me, Chad, you, you, you don't know my story, man. I've really messed up. Listen, I have seen God do amazing things. I have read the stories of God doing amazing things in many men and many women's lives. So this morning, if you want to begin to follow Jesus and ask him to become your Lord and your Savior, I'm not talking about just knowing about him. I'm talking about beginning a relationship with him. Then I want to give you an opportunity to do that. And what we're told is that what I told you, if you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved because of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You and I have hope. You and I have hope to be forgiven of our sin. Because Jesus is the only payment that will ever be accepted for your sin, for my sin. So this morning, if you want to do that, I invite you, you can say this after me, say it out loud or say it in your head, whatever it is you'd like to do. But say something like this, dear Jesus, Lord, come into my life. Make me yours. 
forgive me of my sins and help me to follow you. I need you to be my Lord. And today, you are my Savior. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Every head bowed, every eyes closed, no one looking around real quick. If you said that prayer this morning and you've asked Jesus Christ to come into your life and to be your Lord and your Savior, would you do me a favor? Would you just slip your hand up real quick and say, hey, you know what, this morning I prayed and I've asked Jesus to come into my life. Anybody at all, just put it up. Put it back down. Anybody at all? Maybe you're watching this or listening to this later throughout the week or some other time and you know this is what you need to do. I, I, I would encourage you to do that. But then I want to encourage you to reach out to somebody and visit with them and let them know what's taking place in your life. You can reach us at chadm at redtree.tv or info at redtree.tv. But we want to begin to walk with you. We want to celebrate this moment with you. Because this is not the end. This is the beginning. This is new life that only Jesus can provide. Father, thank you so much for who you are. Lord, thank you for what, what you do. And how you continue to work in our lives daily. And God, as we talked this morning about money and the concept that it gets twisted or distorted. And, and man, we... we we lose our minds at time. God, help us to understand what, what you desire from us. Because in that, we begin to desire and we begin to see what you want for us. So Lord, help us to be obedient. Help us to be faithful children that pursue you daily. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in today. We just wanted to give a huge thank you to those of you that already partner with us through giving. And we've got multiple resources for you to utilize from to do that. You can give online, you can text the number 84321, or you can download our Church Center app. Again, thank you so much for listening today, and we'll see you next time.